welcome to the way we start each new year. A forecast of 10 major changes expected in the year ahead. The forecast and the analysis are both done by Ruchir Sharma and his team at Breakout Capital. So listen in. If you want to know whether you should buy or sell shares this coming year, whether you should expect the dollar to get stronger or weaker against the rupee that will affect your holidays, and many, many more forecasts that should and could change the way you tackle your income and spending in 2024. So thanks very much, Richard, for joining us. This is the 10th year we're doing this. Yeah, 10 years of doing this show, and if I can say so, 25 years plus of doing shows together, starting with your oh. signature budget show. <laughs> No, but this has um, got a kind of impact of its own, this show, right? Well, I think it's just great to sort of recap first how the year has gone by and right. also to try and forecast what's going to come by. And a key thing is there are two forecasting rules I try and keep in mind while doing this. One, that all because a new calendar year begins doesn't necessarily mean that a new trend begins. Quite Many right. of the trends yeah. may be carried forward from right. what was already happening in the previous year. Right. Trends right. don't care about calendar years, yeah. just that we like to define them that way. Right. And the second, it's always a mix of contrarian and yet some trends which are predictable. We always right. like to sound very fashionable if you come ring, up with knee-jerk yeah. contrarian things or sometimes but, say things with great certitude, yeah. uh, which is already happening. So I think right. just a mix of those two is what shapes these trends that we're going to speak about for 2024. But I must say, you generally so far for the last nine years have had great perspicacity. Is that the word? I guess that's why you called <laughs> me again to do this. <laughs> Before we get into this year's forecast though, can we just look at how last year's forecast of yours actually uh, turned out? First of all, let's look at uh, in the top trends. You had said that there would be a long grind and no recession. But the consensus forecast, apart from you, was that recession will be led by the American economy. And you said there won't be a recession, there'll be a long grind, uh, no deep, sharp recession. And in actual terms, there was no recession. There was a massive upside, in fact, in the American economy. Completely different from what everybody else uh, forecast. So this was quite a major, you stuck your neck out here and it turned out okay. Well, but to be fair, the American economy has done much better than even I or anyone expected it to be. Because what we were expecting was that we would get uh, some sort of a long grind. And yet the right. American economy has grown by 2.5%, which for an economy of America's size, is a pretty significant growth rate and even more significant because the rest of the world did not do as well. Europe, for example, almost had a recession. It skirted with a recession. China did very uh, poorly over the past year, I think, as has been well right. documented. But right. there were two bright spots. There was US and then there were emerging markets outside right. of China, including right. India, right. which were relatively resilient through right. this entire phase. So I think that in overall the global economy skirted a recession and we forget that at this time last year more than 60 percent of economists thought that the u.s economy was headed mm -hmm. for a recession amazing and that was quite a forecast because yeah. in the entire history of forecasting economists as a group have never ever predicted a recession okay and your second forecast was that the dollar would decline and again that went against what a lot of people were saying in actual fact the dollar did decline by 3%, which was, again, quite unexpected, and you were spot on there. Yeah, and that's the dollar index, remember, So, which yes. is the fact that then yes. it's skewed by a few currencies. In fact, a lot of currencies, more than half the currencies in the world last year, appreciated against the US dollar. Right. Uh, and right. some had pretty significant appreciation, including currencies in Latin America, currencies in Eastern Europe. Some of those countries' currencies appreciated quite significantly. The weakness was concentrated in really a handful of currencies. The Chinese currency weakened, the Japanese yen weakened, but most currencies last year appreciated Shit. against the US dollar. And yes, that went against the grain or the conversation right. at that time. And the rupee was remarkably stable. In fact, the rupee had arguably its most stable year last year in decades. And something the IMF and all have almost been complaining oh, about that the rupee has been too stable because the RBI has been intervening. But having said that, the dollar in general was 
either stable or depreciated against most currencies. The right. index as a whole was down by 3%, led by strength in a whole host of currencies around Here the world. Here we see the American economy booming, going against everybody's prediction, and Biden's ratings are falling. And the dollar too declined, <laughs> yeah. despite the fact that the American economy itself was quite Doing resilient well. and interest yeah. rates in America went up quite a bit at the short end last year. Right. The, the next forecast you did, your third forecast last year, was that global stock markets would rise more than the American stock market. And the actual fact, the American stock market went up 27% and the rest of the world, the stock markets on average went up 15%. So that forecast was no so not. that didn't work out mainly because of the tech sector yeah, that what yeah. uh, that in america what happened last year was that the mega cap tech stocks apple amazon uh, and increasingly stocks like nvidia these stocks surged last year right they they got the label of the magnificent seven and right. those seven stocks were up more than 100 percent so huge market value already entering into 2023 and then they more than double from that value. So that's what really led the American stock market higher. But the average right. American stock didn't do that well. In fact, you know, if you, the equal weighted index in America right. had single digit type of returns outside of these mega cap tech stocks. But right. these mega cap tech stocks- Basically, AI surprised everybody and changed the way the stock market moved and the tech sector because your fourth forecast was that tech would shrink in 2023. In fact, tech went up 55%, a huge change. So but that again, was again, led again by those main, seven yeah. stocks, because if you take those seven stocks out, the rest yeah. of the tech sector didn't really do anywhere near as right. spectacularly. But right. overall, in terms of these were sort of related, and this is where things didn't play out as I expected, because the AI wave really came and swept and was very concentrated in just seven companies seven stocks, uh, yeah. as far as the returns are concerned. Yeah, and That's you will be looking at the tech stocks for this year ahead as well in next year's forecast, right? Yeah, because it's such a large part of the landscape yeah. that you can't yeah. have any forecast, forecast without for any year taking, without yeah. the conversation uh, then around these stocks. I remember stocks. you talking about television and it, all the, it depressed a lot of media people. You said television will spend less money but content will improve. In fact, what happened was television spend did the growth did drop sharply instead of 25% per annum it dropped to just 9% growth that is a very significant drop and, and the, but the revenue per user went up so you did get better revenues per user despite a drop in the growth of media yeah so that's what we were seeing at this time last year which is the fact that people were going to cut down their budgets quite a bit and my view was that there's just too much content out there, so getting some rationalization of content is likely to produce better quality and seems it sort of played out that way if you yeah. just look at the numbers right. uh, over the past year. One of the big forecasts you made, Japan, which is really floundering for so long, you said Japan will come back. And did it come back? The Japan Japanese stock market went up 25%. How did you see that and what do you attribute it to? Yeah, I think a combination of things that if there's one country which could benefit from some inflation coming back, it was Japan. They were stuck in this deflationary trap to get some inflation back, to get wages to start right. increasing. To, and, and then also their corporate uh, shareholder structure has improved a lot. Okay. And you see a lot of confidence coming back in Japan. The residential real estate market in Tokyo has been dead for a long period of time. That's buzzing. Generally, the confidence in Japan came back. And I think some of that may have also got to do with the fact that they were feeling so outcompeted by China and with China sort of slipping yeah. a bit, I think that also helped. Uh, so I think a combination of factors right. came back and the Japanese stock market did really, very well. And yeah. also the fact that if you go to Japan now, the economy, yeah. the Tokyo residential real estate market, right. you see signs of much greater confidence yeah. in and Japan. You mentioned China and you had said that global companies will move out of China last year. It was a bit ahead of the time because uh, towards the end of last year, it did seem to, everybody seemed to notice that, but you said it right at the beginning of the year. And look at that increase or the investment from America. Actually, if you look at the right hand side of the graph, to China went down, while to Mexico, Canada, Vietnam, Taiwan, and India to some extent, 
investment went up. So what went out of China came into these other countries. Yeah, so in that way, globalization is sort of continuing. It just right. is that it's shifting. Uh, shifting its focus. So you right. have global companies that are moving out of China, especially the US ones, and the wage differential is still quite competitive. So they're going to a whole host of countries from India to Indonesia. Mexico mm. obviously has been the very big beneficiary of this trend. But yeah, China is losing share uh, in every which way, and we'll speak about that more in the 2024 trends. Yeah, okay. You'll be looking ahead at how China will uh, fare uh, this year. Yes. Uh, your eighth forecast last year was that governments which had gone into wild kind of policies, there would be a return to orthodoxy and conservatism. In actual fact, many countries did return to conservative economic policies. Why, why did they change? And what, which are those countries that... Uh, right. So I think that the main thing here is this, that interest rates have gone up. The cost of financing has become much more expensive. And in this environment, that exerts a lot more discipline on countries, particularly in some of these emerging markets that are so reliant on external capital. So you saw last year that Turkey, Argentina, Nigeria, these were some of the basket case countries. And all these countries have seen a shift in their uh, right. policy, often right. because the leadership also has shifted. So I think right. that that was a big in shift. In fact, your happened. next forecast, which we'll just show, was yeah. that the stock markets would go up after elections in various countries. And just look at them. They really climbed after elections. Argentina, stock market up 31%. Turkey, 29%. Poland, 27 Nigeria, 4%. Th only Thailand down 4%. Yeah. But generally, your forecast that after elections, the stock market would go up did happen in all these countries. Yeah, because my forecast was the fact that as you anticipate new leaders, markets uh, share that because they think the new leaders will come, they'll bring a fresh policy focus, they will carry out economic reforms. And so that's what will lift markets. Uh, this is a study that I've done and we in fact spoke about that many years ago that the best returns for a stock market in any developing country typically tend to be in the first to six uh, first six to 18 months of oh, a new, new leader, leader, leader coming to power. Yeah, a new leader yeah. comes to power you it's get all a lot about of fresh. hope and then reality by yes. <laughs> right then you said and this is the last the uh, 10th forecast which you made early last year which there was a lot of depression i mean gloomy feeling and you said in this period look for bluebirds, not black swans. And because they're going to be like lower inflation, you said. Don't think that inflation is going to shoot up and that growth rates are going to plummet like a, the black swan perspective. In fact, in actual, there was stronger growth and lower inflation, which led to solid returns on the stock market. Yeah, so my entire point at that point in time was that we ended 2022. Uh, and when we did the show in early 23, with so much gloom out there, yeah. there was the war in Ukraine. And uh, as we said at the outset of the show, more than 60% of economists thought we were going to have a recession. So there was this very negative mindset. And I said that when you have such a negative mindset, it won't take much to surprise on the upside. And at least from an economic perspective, I think right. we had more positive than negative surprises. I know we had the shock of the Israel Hamas conflict in right. October, but generally right. as a year last year, right. when we look back at it from an economic, from a financial perspective, especially compared to expectations, it ended up being a broadly good year. Okay, with that good record, there's a lot of pressure on you. Let's see what your forecasts are now for 2024, for the year ahead, and we will all change our behavior based on your forecast. And if you good get luck it, with if that. Good luck with that. Okay, your first forecast is, and uh, you make the point that this is going to be the biggest year for democracy. In fact, 46% of the world's population will have elections. That's the highest since 1800. Uh, that's just amazing. And what you add to that, and that's a very crucial aspect, is there's been a major change in the way people vote. Now, only 30% of governments are voted back. There is 70% anti-incumbency. Governments are thrown out. 10, 15 years ago, globally, 70% of governments were voted back. There was exactly. pro-incumbency. So now anti-incumbency. Now, Dorab coined this phrase anti-incumbency many years ago, and the world is catching up with Dorab, finally. Yeah, so this 
term is a very uniquely Indian term, but I think that the rest of the world is going to start using it much more. Because even in places like the US, if you look at it, yeah. and uh, we looked at the analysis uh, that people had done on this, which is that if you look at the first term, the approval ratings right. of leaders, right. those now decline steadily in the first term. It withers away. Yeah. And so the chances of even someone like a Biden getting re-elected today, yeah. the betting market puts the odds at not much better than 30%. Yes. Uh, so yes. I think that's what's going on globally, which is that the fact that we're going to have so many elections is a given. What are the implications of it, I think, is the more interesting point. One of the implications is that given the very low approval ratings, and it's a mystery why approval ratings are so low of right. leaders, because economies, as we argue, has, hasn't done that badly. But in general, because it's of income inequality or general uh, pain that people are facing, that we have this tendency to throw the leaders out. So I think that most leaders going to the polls this year run the risk of losing yeah, that's uh, their amazing, election actually. bid. Yeah, and there's so many elections. That's like what India was. 77 to 2002, those 25 years, 70% of governments were thrown out. Now it's 50-50. So it's like the world is going back to where India was uh, in the in late the 80s. Yeah. Late 80s, yeah, 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 yeah. Your next forecast for 2024 is that with elections coming, governments will spend more and budget deficits will go up. They could rise further. And, but investors don't like that. So they're going to push back. In fact, if you look at the budget deficits, America has gone from 3.5 to 6% of GDP is their budget deficit. India from 4 to 5.6, 5.5 approximately. Uh, Mexico 2 to 4% doubled. And Indonesia has remained stable. So budget deficits are going up. Elections are coming. They're going to go up even further. So investors are worried about that. Yeah. Uh, so that's my forecast as well, yes. that investors will demand a greater premium for holding government debt oh. just because there's so much supply which is going to be coming. And in an election year, what research shows us is that there's a tendency for politicians to spend even more. So I think that that's the big risk that we run this year, that approval ratings in general are low. Now, of course, it's an exception in countries like India and Indonesia, but in most places, approval ratings of leaders are low. They're going to be tempted to spend even more because the easiest thing is to spend other people's money. And, but the tension they'll face is that the budget deficits are already very high. And if you looked at, you call it an epic clash between politicians and investors. And if you look at India, the budget deficit, the biggest worry is the, is the deficit of states. Just explain that. Yeah. States are, are, their budget deficits are a higher percentage of overall budget deficit than ever before. Yeah, and it's also because the amount of spending which is done by Indian states is very high. So in that right. way, we have a true fe uh, federal system that more than 50% of total spending by government in India is done at the state level, which is nearly twice as high as what the global average is. Uh, right. Globally, most of the spending is done by the center. But in India's case, most of the spending is done by, by the, the states. states. And what's going on in the states as well is that a lot of the spending is going towards freebies and other populist right. giveaways. And we saw this in the recent elections too. Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, a lot of populist giveaways promised by the government. I would like to, as a side aspect, calling them freebies, giveaways, etc. There's also welfare measures yes. involved. Yeah. So one should be very clear that it does, when it's targeted right, it does help the yeah. poor. So it's just about the proportion, yeah. which is yeah. that yeah. Uh, like any country needs right. welfare spending and needs welfare state, right? So that's like a given. Question is how much can you afford and how right. much are you spending towards infrastructure and capex and how much are you spending towards welfare? Would it be fair to say that since there are only a couple of state elections, maybe the state budget deficits won't go up so much or they'll do it anyway to win uh, more votes in the general election? Exactly. So the pressure I'm saying in general because is, of the general yeah. election yeah. is that the pressure is going to be to spend much more right. in a year like this. Right. So this is a general yeah. comment. It's not across just about India, yeah. across the world. In but fact, the states here is the difference. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the difference here is the states, but the biggest risk for me is the United States, that they used to run a budget deficit of 3% and now it's going to be 6% for phenomenal. the foreseeable future. It's not as if it's going to be 6% for a year or two. It's yeah. going to be 6% budget deficit the US is going to project it to run 
for the foreseeable future. Unprecedented and, and worrying. Exactly. Right. So in fact, in the, yeah. yeah. Your third forecast, which is actually uh, quite worrying as well, but on a completely different issue, there's been huge amount of migration, immigrants into the developed world. In fact, there's going to be a backlash against my immigration, is what you say. America, immigration's up 35%, UK, 45%, Canada, up 20%, and Australia, up 25%. Now, that's, there's going to be a backlash, but you also say that actually it's helping India a bit because NRIs who are emigrating from here are sending back money and it's gone up to 125 billion in remittances to India. That's huge and hugely helpful for our economy. Yeah, more than 3% of GDP, much more than FDI or other sources. In fact, if you take NRI deposits, that's another 3.5% of GDP. So what the wow. NRIs are sending back to wow. India, the Indian diaspora is sending back to India is quite significant. But if I can just make one point, as you yes, said here yes. about the immigrants, I think that from a developed country standpoint, one thing we have to remember is that in the last year, immigrants in fact played a major role in easing labor shortages, yes, yes. in cooling wages uh, down and also <clears throat> bringing inflation down because you had such an influx of immigrants that helped cool a lot of the inflationary pressures because you had more labor supply right. going into those countries. Right, right. But it also leads to social tension. Exactly. Uh, and the numbers I showed you there are just legal immigrants. The illegal immigrants uh, in places like the US are even higher, higher than, than the The same amount immigrants. again, more than yeah, double this. That's right. right. And now we're seeing that there's a lot of backlash against that. Right. And so we're seeing a cooling off of that pressure. Right. Now, this right. is a bit of a tough choice. On one hand, the local populations here want less immigration because it sort of helps uh, them more and it also uh, keeps the social fabric more intact. But on the other hand, having more immigration helps cool inflation down. Right. Uh, and so that positive goes away. So it's immigrants, immigration is helping the West, but it's also helping Donald Trump. Yeah. Because that social tension you talk about. That exactly. is this uh, anti-immigrant policy, even in the UK. Right, of and even in, yeah, and yeah, in the all election, over actually, and yeah. even the yeah, because the election we saw in 2023 uh, in Poland or the Dutch elections, we in fact saw that uh, immigration be became a big issue, and I suspect it's going to be a very big issue in the 2024. Right, and we have seen well. some governments coming into power, quite uh, nasty governments, nasty rhetoric coming yeah. into power based on anti-immigrant. Uh, statements. Yes, in Europe you've seen that. Now coming to the economy and your fourth forecast, you're saying that there's going to be no bust, no terrible recession, but there will be a slowdown. That's inevitable. And one of the reasons you're saying that is that stocks now are not as overvalued as they were earlier. They were overvalued 45% in 2021. Now they're overvalued 20%. So there's not as much of a drop to happen. You're also saying uh, the rise in interest rates will have no immediate impact because a lot of, say, U.S. interest rates are fixed. So even if the government raises interest rates, people are still paying their old fixed interest rate. Yeah, so I think it's a combination of factors because the big mystery, I think, for many people was that why was there no recession in 2023? Right. Despite the fact that the Federal Reserve raised interest rates so aggressively right. over the past uh, couple of years. Right. And that mystery is partly resolved by the fact that even though the Fed was raising interest rates, a lot of the U.S. consumer, U.S. corporations, they had taken interest rates uh, and fixed, at fixed rates. So right. for the next five, seven years no. and uh, corporations up, you know, for more than 10 years, they've taken these fixed interest rates. So therefore, they didn't feel the impact of high interest rates right, there. Right. But over but time, if interest rates remain high, that impact will be because felt because you have to the refinance time limit, it. You have to refinance, you have to refinance yeah. it, and every year some people will need uh, right. new loans. So there'll be a slow impact. So the what my forecast here is that this is a long grind. Something we've right. spoken about even last yes, year, yes. which is that you will get a slowdown, right. but it'll be spread over time. It'll be won't elongated. Be it won't be like one of those sharp shocks right. like we got in 2007, 2008, right, right. where you got a big jump in interest rates. Many people were exposed right. to it. And so we had a big bust. Now, of course, bust can no, happen any point no. in time, but that's the central forecast. And the stock market right. is already reflecting that. that yeah. uh, Staying in the with US. that stock market, it's a little worrying for India because you say risk to India is from very high expectations. 
that India's stock market valuation is the most expensive in the world. Our stock market valuation is 22, this is the PE ratio, US 20, and the rest of the world only 14. So we're 22 and the rest of the world 14. So are the expectations too high and what are you worried about there? Yeah, so I'd say in general that the overall scenario for, economic scenario for India looks pretty good. Uh, and we have spoken about that. But my only concern is that a lot of this is maybe in the price because expectations are very high. And also volatility is very low in India. In fact, the volatility of the Indian stock market today is technically the lowest in the world. So it's the most expensive market and the least volatile market. If you just look at the Doesn't volatility. Doesn't that disappoint you? you? You guys make money on volatility, don't you? No, in fact, in, uh, <laughs> no, you're, you're a long term. Happening, that, yeah. that there's so much retail speculation in the stock market. A lot right. of people doing futures and options activity. The retail speculation in the stock market is very high. So those are some things to remain concerned about that, uh, and to be aware of even if the underlying economic fundamentals look relatively okay. That expectations are very high and there's a fair amount of complacency set in the price of the Indian uh, stock market. Right, right. I mean, there is a little bit of downside worry, but generally Indian economy is doing okay. But I do have something I'd like to ask you about. Should we be happy with 6%, 7%? To get to another level, to become a moderately developed country, we need 12%. If we sit back and say 6% is great, okay, it's better than many other countries, but we have a low base and 6% is not going to accelerate us the way China accelerated. Yeah, but I've never had such expectations. So you, <laughs> because I guess maybe because I just, sort of in terms of, you know. No, you don't knowing, have faith in, I India's have full faith, 12%. As I've always said about <laughs> India, the line that I've always had, this is a country that consistently disappoints the optimist and the pessimist. <laughs> so I think that as far as I'm concerned, I've always been sort of mindful of the no. fact that it's, very, given the polity of this country, given the, you know, uh, uh, functionality of it that to grow at those rates was always going to be very okay moving on to a, a quite a major uh, forecast you're making about Europe which is doing really s lagging behind everywhere and you're saying time for Europe to bounce back that since 2011 that's more than 12 13 years Europe has lagged behind the US they were going together up till then and then they start there was a gap and you're saying now Europe is going to bounce back and you've Given positives for the Europe, maybe you could actually run us through each of these positives. Yeah, so I think that people are very bearish on Europe, that everyone talks very negative about Europe, and rightly so. You go to Europe, you look at the European infrastructure, it's all very crummy. But my point is that expectations are very low out of Europe today, and Europe has already had a serious downturn. So the first thing you say that Europe's savings are much higher than the US. Yeah, so there are... Uh, list of reasons that right. are given as to why potentially Europe could surprise on the upside. Maybe you could go through that list sure. with so us. Sure, so one I said is that the savings rate, so yeah. it, like as you know, lo right. lots of governments give massive amounts of stimulus. In America, the consumer got the stimulus and has gone and virtually spent all of it. Right. In Europe's case, they have saved a lot of it, partly because of the fact that they are much more cautious. So they have a much bigger savings net And you've also said, from. That's hope for the future that Europe's inflation has declined more than the US. The inflation is much more under control. Yeah, no, but in terms, apart from being under control, it's the fact that it's fallen from yeah. very high levels. Yeah. So they yeah. suffered enormously from the Ukrainian energy crisis. But now that the energy crisis is in the rear view window, and right. so now things are looking a bit better for consumers because inflation rates have dropped so sharply right. in so Europe. That's a, then Europe's wage growth is rising. Yeah, so in terms of the factors that because of the purchasing power has improved because of the decline in inflation, so that's what's happening. And then the last point I mentioned is interest rates. Yeah, which is that's that, a very interesting yeah, one. That in Europe, Europe a lot has of people more flexible interest rates. taken uh, floating exchange floating. rates, so that's the structure of that market. Yeah. So they suffered the shock much more. Already absorbed it. Absor at least part of it compared yeah. to yeah. America. Yeah. So these are some of the reasons why I think Europe has a chance of surprising on the upside. Now remember that and Europe And the upside is, you're saying because you're saying that there's very low expectations from Europe. Yeah. That's your final point. Yeah, because even now when I say this, I'm sure I'll get a lot of pushback yeah. <laughs> saying how can you be even marginally positive on Europe? Don't you? Right see what's happening on the ground there and how grim things are. And every time people have spoken something positive about Europe, it's, uh, it's never worked out because as you showed, 
that for the last 10 to 15 years, Europe has consistently disappointed. Right. A friend of mine bought some uh, hotel in Greece when, in, 10 years ago, and it was in disaster. Now Greece is the best, fastest growing economy or the best economy in Europe. Yeah, that's, a, that's one of the things that we spoke about last year as well, that there are bright spots even within Europe. Right. So I know that we speak about Europe as, just like we speak about India as a uh, one entity, but there right. are very broad differences. Like in India, there are major differences between how the southern states are doing versus let's say the other states of India. In Europe, there's a big difference between some of the Eastern European right. states or the, some yeah. of the uh, countries So what like Greece. Greece does today, Europe does tomorrow. So now it's doing better, everybody will catch up. Yeah, because Greece, Greece remember Greece. like a country that yeah. when we started this show was yeah. the basket case of yeah. the world. Now look at it, yeah. the best performing economy. Moving on, China. This is something you've been right about all along and you've been a little on one side compared to the rest of the world, but China, you say, is fading. The economy is shrinking relative to the rest of the world. The gap between the US and China economies was narrowing, as you can see from the graph, but now started widening as China fades. So the gap, China's fading, and the gap between China and the US economies widening, and China always wants to overtake uh, the US, but yeah, that's This is the graph that fading. Chinese policymakers, I'm told, really look at. Right, uh, right. But I know some of the Western academics right. like to look at purchasing power parity and not yeah. at what the nominal dollar exchange rate right, is. Right. But the Chinese policymakers look at this. They want to be the world's largest economy. economy. They have that ambition. And here, that they were on track of that. They had almost closed the gap with the US. Just a 30% gap was left in 2021. But last couple of years, especially last year, the Chinese economy has been slipping. Right. And you have the US economy, which has been relatively resilient, so the gap is opening. So, and even in the global share, if you, if you right. see, and I'd written about this late last year, that China is slipping, US is sort of doing well, and there are some of the other countries, India, Indonesia, Poland, Mexico, mm. right. these are the countries that, that are, are doing, gaining, gaining from it. Uh, but one of share. the key things, uh, that's a big shocker which you forecast and highlighted, is that to a large extent, China's growth was also helped by a lot of foreign investment, FDI. And now you're saying capital is fleeing China. Net FDI flows are negative for the first time, negative. If you look at that graph, they're dropping into the negative theory, minus, you know, almost $10 billion. That is a huge turnaround for China. Yeah, because during the boom period in China, over the last couple of decades, there were some quarters, quarters, yeah. where the Chinese economy attracted FDI of $100 billion a quarter. My God. In a particular quarter. Now remember, yeah. like in India's case, we get 50 billion or so in the in an entire mm -hmm. year. China was getting $100 billion a quarter. But how mm -hmm. sentiment has shifted that for the first time in recorded history, since this FDI data began for right. China, right. In, the la uh, in the last quarter uh, that we have data for, there was negative that uh, is a huge an outflow change. of 11 billion from China. So that just tells you about how capital is getting reallocated and which countries are benefiting. It's not as right. if the capital is all just going right. back home. Just so these are some of the coming countries. to that, we just wanted to, to the extent that if you had 100 billion coming in in a quarter, not every quarter, but that's bound to have affected your growth rate and hit, make you hit 12% GDP growth. So if we want to go, India wants to go to 12%, we got to get 400 billion in uh, FDI inflow. Yeah, if you look Hopefully. at the East Asian countries, yeah. you know, during the peak of their boom, they were getting FDI flows of three to 4% of GDP. Wow. Um, yeah. Our numbers have improved, but we're still closer to 1%. 1% instead of three to four. Exactly, three to four. So That's we need the four times. That's yeah, a very good times. statistic. Yeah. Moving on to the point you were just coming to, and that is you talk about stars or countries that are emerging outside China. Uh, FDI flows as a share of global FDI, just take a percentage, look at how the changes have taken place. Vietnam gone from point, a lot of FDI is going to Vietnam, yes. up to 1.2. Chile, 1.8, that's more than double, two and a half times. Yes, their share of global FDI. Indonesia, up point, uh, 1 to 1.8, that's again almost doubling. Poland, 0.8 to 2.4, that's three times. In, it's uh, the star Finland. of Eastern Europe. Star of Eastern Europe, yes, my that's God. Right. I didn't know that. India has gone up from 2.4 to 2.8, not exploding, but improving. improving. And Mexico, 
2 to 4.2. Finally, Mexico is having its moment. It's proximity. Yeah. The US should have always made it yeah. very competitive, but Mexico keeps shooting itself in the foot. But finally, it's benefiting. Really is, uh, yeah. yeah. And even Brazil, 3.8 to 4.7. That's, that's a huge increase. So what you're talking about, stars emerging outside China, capital is leaving China for other emerging markets, and a Chinese, it's going down. Yeah. It's so, a huge change you're yeah, talking so this about. Is, yeah. Total amount of capital flows includes investment in the stock market and other flows. Yes, yes. And FDI is you know, just a subset of the balance of payments. Correct, and this correct. is the yeah. broader category. And you can see here that despite higher interest rates in the US and all the negatives which were spoken about emerging markets, you still have decent amount of capital flows. And my feeling is that this year, in 2024, if the dollar weakens, then we are likely to see far greater right. Capital in fact, flows. That's yes. one of your forecasts, dollar weakening. You're forecasting ahead of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> no, so you have said that the dollar decline could accelerate. In fact, US dollar down cycles, if you look at your graph, last six to seven years, there were seven years one, six years, one, and now the down cycle of the dollar has just begun, so it could continue for another couple of a few years. And you also say People say, are there any alternatives to the dollar? I mean, you're talking about it going, but there's no alternative. But there could be alternatives arising. For example, you point out that banks are buying gold now at higher level than ever before. That's like an alternative. Gold is an alternative to the dollar for bank reserves. Yeah. So one of the things that, I, uh, that we had spoken about in the past was that I felt that one of the major geopolitical mistakes that America made was to impose sanctions on Russia in 2022 in the way it did, which is that it virtually threw Russia out of the international payment system, right. seized its foreign exchange reserves. Morally, that may have been the right thing to do, but what it did was send a chill uh, across many countries that if America can do that and has such great control over the financial system, then what stops it from doing it to us one day? And so I think that that's really what has uh, started a move for central banks to say, we can't be this dependent on the US dollar. We cannot have so right. much of our foreign exchange reserves stored in the US dollar. Going back to your review of last year, you said the dollar would decline, which yeah. others were not saying. And now you're saying that decline could continue. Could accelerate, in fact. So all your holidays are going to be cheaper now. <laughs> <laughs> that the uh, decline could, in fact, accelerate. So the, in fact, the other way around, which is that as a US resident, in fact, I mean, I think that the dollar getting uh, somewhat less uh, expensive yeah. is almost better uh, than what it used to be. And what about gold getting stronger, that people should invest in gold? Or I think generally, I think that having some investment in gold does make sense because people are looking for alternatives. The problem right, today right, that is right. that, you know, that the, in the past, if you looked at it, when a currency was declining, you were excited about some of the currency, especially from a long-term perspective. This time, the problem is that the alternatives to the US dollar aren't there so much, right? Because the Chinese should have been the alternative. The Chinese economy yeah. is you know, yeah. still 17% of the global economy. Right. Yeah. Huge. Yeah. Uh, China's share of the global uh, payment system is very small. No one really trusts holding the Chinese currency, given right. what it's backed by. So what do you hold? So things like gold, I think, have been alternatives that central banks have been holding and other smaller currencies, the Swiss franc, the Australian dollar, the Canadian dollar, these are some of the currencies to which people are diversifying. If you had to choose a star competitor to China, is there one or is it going to be multiple? Yeah, I think it's very hard to come up with just one. one. Obviously size wise size, India, yeah. you know, yeah. like I mean has the size to do it, but right. we know that does India have the policy mix to implement the growth rates right. of 10, 12 percent? So I think it's so a India has other to countries. do something huge, huge yeah. because I think that people in the U.S. have made up their mind that yeah. from a strategic standpoint, they want to de-risk from China. Issue is that which countries have the scale which can give them an alternative to China. So far, right. there's no one country with scale, so they're spreading yeah. their bets. Right. But India could be that logical choice where so right. much capital could come in if it was so much easier to do business here on the ground. Right. Amazing opportunity. Okay, your penultimate uh, forecast, number nine. You say the hype in AI stocks, artificial intelligence stocks, are going to get a reality check. Now, I'm obsessed with AI. 
I don't know whether I agree with what you're saying because I think it's got huge potential, but you're saying anyways, people have overemphasized it. So you're saying actually for companies to monetize AI, it will take time, like all the other ones. Similar delays and monetization seen in previous tech innovation waves. And apart from AI, the rest of the tech sector is actually in recession to some extent. For example, you point out, beyond AI, tech was in a mini recession. Tech shed jobs in 2023. Otherwise, other sectors were strong here in the yes. US were strong here. For example, technology sector lost over 70,000 jobs, 71,000, while in the non-tech sector in the US, 2.9 million jobs were created. So it's a completely different. Yeah. So AI has changed the whole perspective well, I think that AI is skewed sector. it, right? Which is that the tech sector right, in right. general has been in a mini recession. And that's right. what the data shows. Yes. But it, it doesn't show up in, let's say, the stock market performance because right. it's so skewed by the AI wave. And what I'm saying on AI, right. Pranoy, is not that AI is not for real. It's a yeah, huge revolution. But if you look at the internet revolution as well, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, in terms of that, it was here uh, right. in 2000. And nobody did, said it was terrible, but it was great. It took time to it monetize. It took time to yeah. monetize it. Right, uh, in terms, right. it took many years for the Good point, tech yeah. giants of the Apples or the uh, even the Googles and the other companies. Really, it took them till about 2009, 10 to start taking off. So my yes, point is the yes. fact that there's been a lot of AI hype, right. which has lifted many stocks, particularly these mega cap tech stocks, even those which have no AI experience so right. far, like Apple, Amazon. Right. They don't do anything in AI yeah, so yeah. far, but they've all been lifted because people are because betting. They're going to come with something. Come to, like you know, Apple is coming something with their phone. They have the capital and yeah. they have AI and stuff like that. And my point is it's going to take time for these companies to monetize it. Their valuations have become very expensive. And in 2024, you'd like to get a reality check where you figure out that, hey, it's going to take them time to monetize this. And so maybe these are not the best places right. to invest in the now, surely years. India, and we are so good at software. I would think we are the smartest people in the world. When an Indian leaves India, he does brilliantly. We are leaders in tech and in politics, actually, now. Right. But you're saying in India, tech outside AI was in a mini recession this As year. As well. The same As trend. Well. Same trend. Same trend. But quite sharp here. You're saying Indian technology startup funding dropped from $41.6 billion to 25.8 down to 7 billion. Is that going to carry on or up? is India going to get on to this AI software potential? Yeah, I think potential? that eventually it will, but my point is that, right. that the global trend in the tech sector is likely to persist. I don't see the tech sector exiting its recession phase, mini recession phase even, anytime soon because so much uh, of the excesses were built over the last few years. So right. therefore, I. And in India's case too, if you look at the latest hiring trends, I was reading somewhere that only 10 to 15% of new graduates are likely to find a job because the tech sector is such a large uh, absorber of right. graduates My and gosh. higher paying jobs. But yet the numbers show there's a big crunch in right. the freshers being hired in the tech sector. So yeah, there's, so, globally there's a mini tech recession going on. AI and those seven, eight stocks sort of obscured that because they were in a different orbit. Give me an example, name those seven stocks, this yeah, magnificent so you seven. Split it. So you have Nvidia, which was really the star really? company, yeah. and they're clearly benefiting from all the chips they're actually and the making technology, money. but yeah. they're making money because <laughs> yeah. of AI, and people are still very optimistic about that. Then you have Alphabet Google, so to speak, right. along with the likes of Microsoft. Run by an Indian, run by Microsoft Indians. run by an Indian. Yes, which have a lot of AI sort of Indian experience. Origin, so, yeah. so they are there, so those are three stocks, let's say. And then you have, as I said, Apple and Amazon, which really don't have much in AI, but they've also got lifted yeah. by this AI wave because people thought they had the money right. and they had the power to be able to spend. Right. And then you have a couple of other stocks like Meta, you know, the Facebook owner. Right, right, and then right. you have uh, Tesla. So these are right. what are referred to as the oh, magnificent, magnificent Seven. seven. Okay. And very mega cap companies with market cap in the hundreds of billions of dollars or trillions of dollars. And these are the star American companies which lifted the American market and they rode the AI wave right. last year. So there's a, is there an underlying message that the decline in funding of Indian tech in the last two years, that India should quickly get on to AI and we'd be so good at it? Yeah. Should we move fast? Yes, we can. But it's very difficult yeah. to, get, to yeah. get that technology and to, and to do things at that scale. 
Right. So therefore, what the market's doing is betting on just a few companies doing it. Okay, your 10th forecast, and then we'll do a quick summary of all of them. This is right out of the you know, blue. You're saying that political agenda in movies in the West, political agenda is hurting movies. Hollywood box office visits that number of people falling for the last 20 years and are still pretty low. Yeah. And in India, what we're seeing is relatively also falling because cricket is just booming. More cricket and less Bollywood in India. IPL broadcast right revenues have gone from 0.1 to 1.6 billion. And box office revenues for Bollywood have only gone from 0.4 to 0.85. Right, and this That's is over 15 years. Exactly, yeah, over 15 yeah, years. Yeah, you'd expect much more. That's right. So I think that the point here is this, that if you, that there's been a lot of discussion as to why people aren't going to the movies like they used to go. Yeah. And the popular answers are that it's because of streaming, there are other forms of entertainment right. which right. are available. And what I'm trying to sort of say is that a, one big underappreciated reason is that a lot of movie makers have forgot the art to entertain, partly because they have their own agenda, their own political agenda. Many people in Hollywood are tend you saying to be... Woke? Whatever that word yes, means. I think, so. I think, you know, like in terms of yeah, tend whatever, to be yeah. woke or very left of center. And right. they want to show that. And a live example for me was that I went and saw this movie, Napoleon. It's right. about one of the great emperors of all time. Right. And the entire movie focuses on making him like this <laughs> grumpy old man uh, who had absolutely nothing redeeming about him apart from the number of wars he launched and the number of people who died in the wars. Almost that as he bad as Churchill. <laughs> a grumpy yeah. old man. So I think that that's really how they showed him in the movie. And, right. I, so and it was very a very wrong right. projection. And it did badly. And there's a side of that as well. Right. But it did badly and a lot of my friends refused to go see it because they knew <laughs> that this was going to happen and they didn't want right. a wrong reading of history right. to be uh, right. learned for either them or for their children. So the whole point here being that there are many reasons why Hollywood's in trouble. But one of the underappreciated reasons is that there's a political agenda and even in India, sometimes I feel that... Some of the movies, they are they're not woke, it. it's the other extreme, it's right? It's the other extreme sometimes Fight, in smash. terms of you know, what we want to do, but that you have to understand that that satisfies a particular constituency, right. but it does not yeah. carry everybody, everybody back to you. the movies. And yeah. I think that Very that's interesting. Uh, true, particularly okay. in America. And cricket? Yeah. I because it doesn't have a political agenda, it's doing very well. Yeah, so in cricket you may have your own internal politics, <laughs> but I think that the key thing is this. Yeah. And also it's much more democratic in a way. That, that yeah. in, in the case of Bollywood, there's been so much thing about the same stars dominating after right. 30, 40 years. Right, right. So much talk about nepotism and stuff. Right. But yet when it comes to cricket, you have people who come from such small towns, from Correct. very modest yeah. backgrounds, they're able to rise. And it is IPL, a major difference. And IPL yeah. has been such a big revolution because I suspect right. that if you didn't have IPL, I don't think that people have the attention span to watch very long format stuff anymore. But IPL has just been such a revolution and the right. valuation shows up that the valuation of the Enormous. IPL has gone up. Yeah. When IPL was launched, it wasn't even worth a billion dollar league. Right. Today, the valuation of the IPL is close to $15 billion. $15 billion compared to $1 billion. Yeah, and just even less than fact, $1 billion. Yeah, and as far as movies right. are concerned, the, you know, the growth has been very, 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 very incremental. Slow. And we'll have a good year like right. uh, 2023 relatively. But even 2023, the total box office receipts in dollar terms globally from right. Bollywood was not very different from what it was in 2019. Right. So the growth is just so yeah, limited yeah, and yeah. we need to do more Major, introspection as to why this is not working yeah. rather than be delusional that oh it's mm -hmm. just a matter of time right. before the audience comes no, back. Things have to change. That's a very, I had no idea about this uh, comparison. Well, I learned a lot again. Now you have to, for people like me, summarize all 10 points and you have 10 seconds. <laughs> right. Sorry, you have five minutes. Yeah. Let's so, go point by point, your yeah. first point. Yeah, so just to summarize, as I said that it's the biggest year of for democracy, that's a fact. The right. data shows that. Right. What's the implication? The implication I'm saying is that, uh, one, a lot of the leaders, especially in the Western democracies, have relatively low approval ratings. Right. And with relatively low approval ratings, expect many of them to lose the election, the re-election bid that they have. So that's the first implication. So many are going to be thrown out. Thrown out, as we right. said, anti-incumbency, uh, an Indian term goes global <laughs> yeah. as a trend. So I think that's the first. The second implication is that the politicians versus investors, there could be an epic clash. 
flowing from the first, which is the fact that you have so many politicians so out So many there. elections also happening. That's why, yeah. that you have so many elections happening, low approval ratings, and generally there's a tendency in election years for politicians to spend, spend a lot. And, yeah. and the budget deficits are already very high, yeah. much higher than what they used to be before the pandemic, right. from US to even India. Right. And so, there's a, uh, so you have to be mindful that, that some of the investors may not like the they fact don't that like they have so much fiscal deficits. indiscipline. They don't like high budget deficits. At least some check on politicians, well done. That's right. Okay, point three. Yeah, point three has to do with the fact that a big trend, again, related to the first one. You've got elections coming up, and a big thing is that you've also had a surge in immigrants that have come right. into some of these countries. In the US, in fact, now, you have a massive surge, and that's what also gives people like Donald Trump a big agenda, because you have a surge in immigrants. It helps the US economically in some way, because it cools inflation yes. down, eases labor shortages when unemployment is very low. Right. But it right. also becomes a fertile political, ground yeah. for political backlashes, right. for people to capitalize. Because remember, people in any country don't like the social fabric to change too yeah. much. And they see them as a threat in. taking their job, which is not true, but that's the perception. Yeah. One thing which I must admit that I used to say, oh, it's so sad that IIT graduates were the smartest in the world, are all going abroad. Why can't they stay? But you did point out that the amount of money coming back from Indian migrants abroad is huge. Yeah, and the that Indian is helping us. support is yeah. quite incredible. That it's really, if you take uh, NRI remittances and NRI deposits, right. they're more than 3% of GDP each. So yeah. they're doing much more huge. than what point any other four. flows are doing. Yeah. Now you're point four. Yeah, so the fourth point I, I spoke about was the fact that we've not had the classical bust so far. Interest rates have gone up a yes, lot. Yes. People expected there to be a bust. We have like high interest rates. My point People is, expected a recession which yeah, hasn't happened. Yeah. Exactly, but I'm saying don't rule out a further slowdown. Slowdown, okay. Because of the fact that it, the air may come out of this balloon slowly because a lot of interest rates have been taken at fixed rates. So it may take a while for the impact to feed through, but the impact will come through, but it may not happen in a sudden way, it will happen in a slow way and, a, and in a way that's already been happening as a reason that even though the American stock market did well last year, over the last couple of years, the American stock market has gone nowhere. So uh, slow down, but not a huge recession. Point number five, time for Europe to bounce back. Expectations very low. People are very pessimistic. And yet there are reasons why Europe may be a bit more resilient from yeah. higher savings to the fact they've already absorbed some of the pain with uh, right. floating rate, interest, uh, rates, yeah. interest rates compared to fixed rates. And as I said, that just like Japan we spoke about a year ago, when expectations are very low, doesn't take that much to trigger some upside. And your, your next forecast, number six, that China, I mean, what a, what a sharp downturn there. Yeah, so money is fleeing China, global investors want to de-risk from China. There's so much geopolitical tension also right. behind that. And, and stars are emerging that. outside China, you point out. Right, and so there are other alternatives emerging. And China, as I said, uh, some of the growth drivers aren't there anymore. The demographics in China, you know, China, that uh, their population for the first time now is actually shrinking. Uh, so right. uh, a shrinking population is not great uh, for, for growth. economic growth or for right. economic dominance right. uh, either. Your seventh forecast? Yeah, so... We've been the stars emerging outside, yeah, so we, that you've explained. Uh, spotted some of them. We spoke about how Mexico is doing particularly right. well. Mexico. Uh, that even countries like India, Vietnam, Indonesia, these are all countries outside of China right. that are benefiting uh, from global right. investors and that India, from China. This is a huge opportunity for India because we have the size of the economy and with money flowing out of China, India must try and grab a bigger exactly. share. Exactly, especially the is. FDI share. Right. right. Now, dollar decline could continue. Right. So the dollar's already been declining, as I said, but if you look at it historically, once a dollar decline begins, it tends to last for six to seven years. Right. For the last 50 years, we've been in a freely floating exchange rate system. The dollar's gone up and down. Its up cycles have lasted for up to a decade. Its down cycles have lasted for six to seven years. We right. could just be in the second year of that. Okay. And typically in the second year, you tend to see Very the decline accelerate. Now, artificial intelligence, you're, you're not saying it's a, it, it is a great thing. It's a but huge revolution. It takes yeah. time to monetize any revolution in tech. That's right. So expectations have been very high and they've all been loaded onto these magnificent seven stocks that we spoke right. about for delivering 
right. on the AI revolution. And I say that expectations are very high. If you look right. at the historical templates, it takes a while for the uh, uh, expectations to be realized for companies to know how to monetize. So the Magnificent Seven have used AI, have developed it, or they are expected to develop it, so their stock prices have gone up, but the others have not. Is there a chance that even the smaller companies will now move into AI? They have to. I think they that, have to. That, that's the right. imperative. And India but, has to as well. Yeah, but I think it's going to take a while for this to fully play itself out. As I said, yes. even yes. after the, uh, in the internet yes. revolution, right. when, like, after the internet was developed in the 1990s, it really took a few years. The tenth and final one was the political agenda is hurting movies. Yeah. In Hollywood, definitely, and also perhaps even in Bollywood. Yeah. Different types of political agenda, one woke, one not, opposite of woke. Right. But, uh, yeah, so I'd say that's that, amazing. Yeah, it's an underappreciated reason for why yes. people aren't going back to the movies like they used to go. And I think that this is something which is not discussed enough, and I don't see any big change in that. So I still right. feel the movie industry, whether it's in Hollywood or Bollywood, struggling because of the fact that they have not figured out that how do you get the audiences back there and I think that they get and there's a lot of self-congratulation in India that you know 2023 four five massive hits and the movies right. are back and stuff right, right. but you look at the data and you'll figure out that, that it's going to take a while and it's going yeah, to take, yeah, that is, yeah. that, that this is not and Amazing. look at the contrast with cricket now I'm going to do something without uh, which may embarrass you but we are all here, very excited about your new book coming out. So can I just talk about it? Ruchir is bringing out a new book. It's called What Went Wrong With Capitalism? And I just love that cover. Ruchir, can we pre-order? <laughs> well, it's out in June, and I think I uh, would love to come and chat with you about it. Quickly, and, uh, in a yeah. nutshell, what is it about? Yeah, so I look at the you know, 100-year history or so of capitalism, and what I say is that there's a popular perception today that people are unhappy. Uh, right. that if you look at the mood of the nation polls in America and so many other countries, right. uh, especially yes. like in the West, there's a lot of unhappiness yes. about the economic system. Right. And I try and analyze that, why are people so upset with what they think is capitalism today? And I argue that what you really have today is in a way socialism for the rich in particular and you have too much of a bailout culture right. and risk has been socialized. So what we have today is a distorted form of capitalism. Yeah. This is not That's the capitalism we, that we yeah. originally okay. was uh, Very interesting. What's, we have, what's what we have in India? Socialism for the rich, capitalism for the poor. Right. But there's well, really it's changed a lot. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of welfare stuff going yeah. on. But my yeah. point is that, that we uh, mollycoddle the rich, yeah. the financial <laughs> people far too much yeah. and do not allow enough risk in the system for capitalism yeah. truly function, and there are consequences for that. It leads to lower productivity, it leads to higher inequality. Right. Right. So there are consequences which hurt yeah. people, and I try and, and analyze how we have come to that stage. Really looking forward to this book coming up. Thank you very much, thank you very much for all this, and I'm going to lead my life this year based on exactly these 10 points. So you better have 90% next year, or 80% at least. Otherwise... Well, good luck to that, but <laughs> hope to be back. Okay. And more cricket, definitely. Yes, thank uh, you. Thank you very much indeed. That was just fascinating. Learned a lot. Thank Thanks you. Thanks You work hard sometimes, right? <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. Thank you very much. Thank you.